All right, 1.4, uh, the, the title is Continuity and Its Consequences. And I'm going to do something that is not how I would normally um, approach a subject, is I'm not going to define for you what I mean by continuity, so I just want you to use the imagery that you have whenever you hear that word. I want you to think of the following real-life functions, each of which is a function of the variable time. The first one is the height of a falling object. The second one is the amount of money in a bank account. And the third one is the cholesterol level of a person. Which one of these are continuous and why? So I want you to jot down your answer, your thoughts on that. So you're trying to look at those three different functions and decide, are they continuous? And if they're continuous, why? So what do you guys think? Which of those three functions, or any of them, are any of them continuous? The cholesterol level, because it's always changing. It never really, because um, everything is eventually, they hit something that can stop, or it'll hit like a bottom or zero. Okay, so the cholesterol level is a possibility. What do you think? Did you guys think cholesterol level is continuous? Okay, it is. It's a continuous one. Not for exactly the reasons you're saying, but that's okay. You've got some of the right ideas there. Either of the other two continuous? Amount of money in the bank account. What do you think? Is it continuous? That one actually is not continuous. We'll talk about why. How about the height? Yes. The height one is continuous as well. Stop Height of our falling object, I left the word falling out, but. All right, so let's talk about in a real world sense what we're talking about when we mean continuous, and then we'll sort of make amends with that when we get to our graph. The idea of being continuous means that when the, we'll do the object one because you can sort of visualize this one happening. When that object is falling, it can't stop at a height of four and somehow jump to a height of seven, or I, I said it the wrong way. Stop at a height of 7 and jump to a height of 4 without going all the way through 7 down to 4. It has to pass through every single height as it falls, right? There's no jumping around allowed. So you kind of have this sort of picture in your mind of the, of the object itself moving, and it has to do it in a smooth way. Now, the cholesterol may not happen in a smooth way, but it certainly has to pass through all the objects or all the values. So if you're talking about your cholesterol going up and down, it has to pass through every value as it goes up or as it goes down and moves around, right? There's no jumping around. Can your bank account jump around? Yeah, in fact, that's what it usually does, doesn't it? You typically don't add one dollar at a time or one penny at a time to your bank account, right? It's not the way it works. You know, your paycheck comes in or your rent check comes out or however it is you're working on your bank account. It's going up and down by incremental amounts every time you're doing anything with it. So that's the idea of being continuous in a real-world sense. Now, from a dis definitional perspective, continuity says the following. If you have a function f, and it's defined on an interval containing the point a, we talk about the function being continuous at a if the limit is equal to the function value. Otherwise, we say it's discontinuous. So up until now, we just were talking about limits. And we had the ability to talk about a graph that looked something like this and say that hole in the graph does not affect the limit value. And it doesn't. It does not affect the limit value. But it does affect the fact that the graph is not continuous there. And the reason it's not continuous with this definition as a basis is because the function value there is not existing. Right? I've got a hole. I don't have a function value at that point. And even if you had a graph that did something like this, 
That is, it's got a function value, but the function value is not the same as the limit value. It's also not continuous. Now you may have sort of, from a, a visual point of view, thought about before that this idea of continuity has to do with, do I have to pick up my pencil to draw it? Have you talked about it like that before in a class? There's a very real sense to that happening in this graph, right? I couldn't have drawn this graph without sort of picking up my pencil to be able to draw it. Okay, so this is the idea of continuity from a definitional perspective. The limit value has to equal the function value for it to be continuous. So we're going to look at this idea and we're going to take a look at how to create functions where this works. All right, so we've got a function defined here, f of x. It's x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. First of all, we're going to determine where f is continuous. And the reality is that when we're looking for where f is continuous, what are we really going to be looking for? Where it's discontinuous. And we're going to exclude that spot. So when we're looking for where f is continuous, we're really looking for is it ever discontinuous? Is there ever a place where I have a problem? And then this idea of extending the function, I'll show you what that means when we get to that part. So the first thing is, is there a place where this value is going to be discontinuous? Yes. 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 So this will be discontinuous <clears throat> and I heard all of you saying this at x equal negative 1, right? Why? The negative 1 would make that denominator 0, right? And that's a problem. We, we can't have that happen. So one of two things happens if that denominator be, is be going to be 0. What are one of those two things? We get an asymptote or we get a hole in the graph. Make sense so far? Okay. If we have an asymptote, we are not going to be able to do the second part of this problem. There's not going to be a way to extend this. Okay. If we have a hole in the graph, we will be able to do the second part of the problem. So how do we figure out if we have an asymptote or a hole? Factor. We factor it. Very good. All right, so we look to see if we're able to factor this and reduce it, right? And so does that numerator factor, what will it factor into? All right, so what reduces? X plus 1, which means does this have an asymptote or does it have a hole? It has a hole. So this one has a hole in the graph. <coughs> It has a hole because if you were to graph this, it would have the same graph as the graph x minus 1. The image would be exactly the same, but it would have a hole in that location because from the original function we were given, we were not allowed to have an input value of negative 1. It is a value that's not in, we would call it in, in algebra, we've talked about it as a domain issue. It's not in the domain because the original function that was given has a problem in it. It has a problem as, as a denominator that could potentially be 0 and it would be at x equal negative 1. All right, so we have the ability to extend this. Now, I think it's later in a different lesson. It may be later in this one. I can't remember where I define what happens this. This location where it's discontinuous, this actually is called something that's called a removable discontinuity. We're able to create this other function that does this extension idea. So here's what we're going to be doing to actually extend this value of f of x. So f of x really has the function value x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. And it has that value everywhere except for at x equals negative 1. So this is good whenever x does not equal negative 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to define what in the world we're going to let our function be when x does equal negative 1. So take a look again. So this is the answer to the question before is What's, what's happening? Why do I have this problem? I mean, if this reduces in this way, isn't it going to just look like this line? And the answer is yes, except there's going to be a hole in the graph. The hole is going to be at x equals negative 1. What is the value of the limit at x equals negative 1? It's negative 2. Because that's the missing piece on this graph. The value right here at x equal negative 1, if we had used this reduced sort of equation here in the middle, would have been what we would get if we plugged negative 1 in for x. It would actually be the value of negative 2. That's where my hole is. My hole is at negative 2. So what I want to do is I want to sort of fill in the hole. And I can fill in the hole by simply creating a piecewise function that says, okay, 
everywhere except x equal negative 1, I can use this equation. But if x is equal to negative 1, I'm going to fill in the hole by simply telling you that the limit value that I want, what I want it to be, is the value that I would have gotten if the graph were complete. And that value is at negative 2. This is the extension that I want. So it probably isn't a better idea to actually, a good idea to actually call this f of x. Let's give it another name. How about we call it g of x, just so it has something else to call it. It is not the same function. It is an extension of the function that I started with. So this is the extension function that we were asked to find. I never actually answered the question, where is it continuous, the original function. I answered the question, where is it discontinuous? So I need to go back up and write down the continuous answer that I was supposed to have written. So do you guys remember interval notation? All right, so this function is continuous from, in fact, let me write it that way. This function is, that wasn't what I wanted to do, just a sec. Is continuous from negative infinity to negative 1 union from negative 1 to infinity. Interval notation, is that okay with everyone? If you're unsure about that interval notation, see me after class, come see me in my office hours and I'll remind you how that works. But your book is going to be using it and assuming that you remember those pieces. Does this make sense? This is a little different. We haven't done anything like this, right? This idea of extending the function. All right, let's take a look at the next one. The next one says, determine where f is continuous, if possible, extend to a function on a larger domain. Now notice it does say, but the last one did too, it just says larger domain. It doesn't mean that the domain that we've, we're going to get to is going to be everything. Now on this other example it was, I was actually able to extend this to include all numbers. I now have an input value and an output value for every x value, right? I mean, I can use any real number as an input and it will work. That's not going to happen on this function. This function looks like the last one, doesn't it? It's just flipped. It's flipped upside down, right? It's reciprocal. So I actually have a bigger problem with my discontinuities. Where is this function discontinuous? Mm -hmm. This one is discontinuous at x equals 1 and x equals negative 1. Now, in thinking about that, it's a little bit more um, messy, I guess you could say, to write down where it's continuous. But this function then is continuous from negative infinity to negative 1, from negative 1 to 1, and then from 1 to infinity got three pieces because it has two locations that I can't equal. Now, the answer to the question of can't, is it possible is it po to do this extension, the answer is going to always be yes if I have the ability to factor and reduce. And I do here on this one because we've already done this factoring or reducing with this particular one just flips up, flipped upside down. So you guys know that this factors in such a way that that x plus 1 is reducible with the x plus 1 in the denominator, right? So this actually is equivalent to 1 over x minus 1, except that I still can't actually plug in the value x equal negative 1, for real, because that would still have made the original denominator 0, right? Now I can still create a function, it's just not going to be a good function everywhere. So this is on a larger domain. It will have the same original function with the same original I can't equal these values kind of thing going on. So this is not good at 1 or negative 1. The other piece, it does actually work when x is equal to negative 1. What will this function value be if I use my reduced equation here in the middle when x is equal to negative 1? That's negative 1 half. There's still a value x can't be, right? I still can't have an x value of 1. I still have an asymptote in this graph. 
but this new g of x function is an extension. It's a bigger domain than the other one that I had. Okay? So if you're ever able to reduce, you're able to extend the domain. If you had a function that was not reducible in any way, shape, or form, then you wouldn't be able to create anything extension, any extension for it. Any questions on that one? All right. I mentioned this remark um, because it's in your book and it's actually really important when we think about this to think about it in three different pieces. Remark 4.1, all it really does is it takes this continuity definition and it sort of pieces out what it really means. All right? This continuity definition says the following three things, that if we have a function continuous at A, three things have to happen. Number one, f of A must be defined. That is, it must exist. Have to have a value there. Some value, any value, but it has to exist. The second thing, the limit must exist. Got to have a limit value as well. And then the third thing is that the limit value and the function value, they have to match. Did everybody get that written down? Okay, we have to stop there, and we'll pick up there next time.